Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, and for those of you who missed the talk on Saturday, I've just brought one video which occurred. This is an injury which occurred during the event, uh, which I thought you may wish to see. If I can bring this up for you. So we look head on and look at keeping an eye on the guy in the white shirt to, to, uh, just behind this guy and watch his head. So track athletics in, in Paralympics is not uh, quite the same. We do get these, it's, it's more like a road race. And so the, the types of injuries that you get are different. So I just highlight that to you as an example of some of the differences between Olympic and Paralympic sports. But we're going to completely change what we're going to talk about now. Um, and talk about the Achilles tendon, which is one of my favorite topics. I'm not quite sure how I really got interested in that. I suppose I kept seeing an awful lot of athletes with Achilles uh, problems. And probably also pretty unhappy with the explanations that we had from the literature about uh, what the cause was and how to treat it. And uh, looking around, there's enough people in the room who are uh, as old as I am who can remember when it was called tendonitis. And we used to stick anti-inflammatories on it and we used to use ultrasound. And, and then this new wave of thinking came along. It's tendinosis, it's, it's a degenerative thing. And suddenly we, we flipped the whole way that we manage this process. And really we still have a, a, a lot of uh, things to work out in terms of causation and optimal management. And so what I'm talking about today is some of the new technologies using a varieties of ultrasound to look at the biomechanical properties of the tendon to see whether that can assist us in either prevention or management of Achilles tendon problems. As we know, the Achilles is one of the most frequently injured tendons. Um, it's very common. It's one of the most common overuse injuries in athletes, particularly performing endurance events. And what we're trying to avoid ultimately is uh, having the, the rupture in the athlete. This is, you know, a, a catastrophic injury for the athlete. But it's interesting that if you look at the data, yes, it does occur in sportsmen, but it also occurs in middle-aged, sedentary people. In fact, the peak incidence of rupture of the Achilles tendon is around age 40, and then it rises again later on, and actually occurs, we see it, in older people. So this concept that we have of the athletic uh, injury of overuse causing this degeneration and rupture is slightly challenged by the epidemiological evidence about the population who also experience rupture of the tendon. So we've got these peaks of incidence at about 39 and age 80 and this steady rise after age 60. And the other interesting thing is more than 66% of these people have no tendon pain prior to the time of their rupture. The first inkling that there's something wrong with their Achilles tendon is when it goes pop. So if we can develop techniques to enhance our understanding of why this is occurring or detect it earlier, maybe, then maybe we can put in place different strategies that will prevent this occurring. The histological analysis of ruptured tendons tends to show that most of them are degenerate. Studies showing 97% of ruptured tendons were degenerative. So there's something already going wrong with the tendon because the t Achilles tendon itself per se is a really strong structure. It can usually under under, you know, load of around 4,000 newtons. It's a really strong structure if it's healthy and intact. So it has to be abnormal uh, in most cases unless there's massive force. So um, something is going on causing a process which is subclinical in a lot of cases which then leads to the increased loading and degenerative change and then rupture. So our problem with these typical mid-portion or non-insertional Achilles tendinopathy is sometimes they may have no symptoms at all or the symptoms may be of morning stiffness or pain with or after activity you may be able to warm it up and it feels a bit better, which is why they don't report it during sports, because it feels better once they're doing their sport. 
But sometimes people will notice, oh, I've got a bit of a lump on the back of my heel, and if I rub it, it's a bit sore. So it may present in this way, and we often use a fairly blunt tool, the Visa A score, to start to look at that. And this is developed by Jill Cook and colleagues. Um, and uh, so an objective way of measuring, um, uh, assessing the severity of symptoms in people with uh, uh, Achilles uh, pain. And it's always intrigued me this, I don't know how many of you have used this with people, that it, because it's inverse in the way that no pain uh, is, scores 10 and lots of pain scores 0, it often confuses patients when you first speak to them about this inverse relationship between um, no pain is, is a, a higher score. And it's often different to when we're using visual analog scales where, where you say 10 is the highest score, is the highest pain. And we have to, you have to talk to the patient through the, um, the, the uh, scoring system very carefully to make sure you get the correct score. But it's one way that we can look at objectively severity of symptoms in relation to pain but also function. Uh, and then we can monitor that over time to look at the impact of our uh, um, treatment. We can use MRI, but MRI, as we know, is expensive, it's time-consuming, and it doesn't allow contra easy contralateral comparison. So if we've got paid on the right, how do we compare that to the left? Because if it's asymptomatic on one side, we still need to examine the opposite side. And so it has significant limitations. So kind of the standard tool for investigation of the Achilles tendon is obviously first the history and examination, but then using diagnostic ultrasound which allows this contralateral comparison, allows compression of the tissue, and it allows a dynamic assessment looking for tears. We can look at how the retrocalcaneal bursa moves around the, uh, uh, the heel, and we can look at the vasculature, looking for neovascular infiltration using the power Doppler. And also, not many people appreciate that actually at uh, this level it has a higher spatial resolution than MRI. So it's, it's a much clearer, crisper tool. And then if we want to do any uh, in interventions, we can use it for, for guiding it. And it's also economical for the health service and for the patient. Um, you know, once you've purchased the machine, it's just the operator cost, and you can do repeated measures with minimal cost. The typical appearances of kind of a, this fusiform swelling of the mid-portion, areas of mixed echogenicity, low signal change, and this neovascular ingrowth. And I think this is quite intriguing because if you look histologically at these areas where these blood vessels are growing in, we'll also see very small nerves accompanying them. And it's quite typical that all around the body, nerves and vessels travel together. And the stimuli for those are the same. Um, little uh, triggers that, 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 that stimulate uh, new vessel ingrowth also s stimulate new neural ingrowth. And we seem to appear to think that this is why that the, the Achilles become more painful and more sensitive because it's not the vessels which are causing pain, but the neural ingrowth that's accompanying it that is associated with that increased discomfort. And this is just a transverse view to assess it uh, again. But uh, Karen Khan, as many of you will know, is a colleague here, uh, published saying there's no relationship between imaging findings and symptoms or clinical outcomes. And it's also difficult because we often see a patient who presents with a, uh, Achilles tendinopathy and we say give them a standard eccentric program and in six weeks time they're feeling better but the ultrasound appearance hasn't changed dramatically. So the imaging changes, changes take much longer to improve than do the clinical symptoms. So how useful is the standard B-mode ultrasound appearance in helping us tell us what is the quality of that tissue like? How much load can I place on this tendon safely, given that the appearance looks exactly the same as it was six weeks ago? So it's a bit more challenging. And how do we use these uh, B-mode images to direct us in terms of our rehab? So we're all aware that exercise is kind of the front line of um, management of tendinopathies, that we know that exercise is good for tendons, it causes hypertrophy and it changes the material properties and the, for a long period of time eccentric loading has uh, been thought to be an important part of that. 
But we also know that disuse and immobilization decreases collagen synthesis. So if we want someone to get worse, we'll put, stick them in plaster for six weeks and we'll see decrement in the uh, cross links between uh, uh, the collagen fibers. So well, this is one of the uh, kind of the first papers, uh, Hacken Alfredson and colleagues looking at uh, the effect of eccentric training in patients uh, and looking at uh, changes in pain and, and structure. But then Jonathan Rees in this publication just a couple of years ago in the British Journal in Sports Medicine was, talking about, was challenging this initial model that uh, Alfredson had. Why do they work? What are the problems? How can we improve them? And I think this is something that we are not so good at is looking at someone has given us a published a paper that says this is the regime for doing these exercises and we kind of stick with that religiously rather than challenging what are we trying to do with this particular um, um, form of stretching or, or, or treatment and then it comes back again uh, this was a paper just published last year from Jeffrey Verrill and colleagues in, in Australia and Adelaide looking at the eccentric exercise program so we're quite good at telling patients what to do, but the rationale for how many repetitions, how much load, etc., whether it should be high load, uh, isometric, concentric, eccentric, we do it a little bit like this at the moment. The, the scientific evidence is not perfect. We look, we, we, we're not great at understanding the response between the amount of load and the change in the Achilles tendon mechanical properties. So for me, the question is, is it possible to try and track change in tendon properties that relate to functional capacity because that's what it's about really what is it this patient or athlete safe to do based upon the mechanical properties of the tendon so if we had a tool that could do that perhaps we could have earlier detection of, of problems if we could see a change in in the mechanical properties of a tendon occurring before it occurred in symptoms or on a standard uh, B-mode ultrasound imaging, maybe that would be useful in instigating a prehab program before th problems occur. Or if we had a way of looking at mechanical properties, could we optimize our rehab protocol? And could we make safer return to play decisions based upon our understanding of the properties of the tendon rather than just symptoms or the standard appearances? So over the last few years, there's been a few different um, approaches to this using different methods of ultrasound to try and answer some of these questions. And there's one called ultrasound tissue characterization and then compression elastography and shear wave elastography. And I'm going to discuss these three different methods and some of the pros and cons of each of these. UTC, as it's known, was originally uh, devised for imaging equine tendons. And it was developed by uh, Hans van Schie and colleagues and first started publications in the late 1990s and first used in the human tendon around 2010. Now, I believe that uh, there's some people here are using this at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah. So you have a machine here. So I, I'm just going to, to talk over some of these issues and also challenge some of, some of the thoughts around it. So it's an automated, uh, the transducer, the ultrasound transducer, which you can see here, is in this cradle, which is automated, and it moves across the surface of the tendon. And it takes these, these, these uh, number of repeated images, and then it uh, produces a 3D block of ultrasound images of the tendon. And it uses computer software and complex algorithms to characterize the different areas and, and, and divides them into one of four echotypes providing a value for the tendon structure and integrity. This is one of the first papers uh, uh, going, going back looking at this. Um, when uh, you can see on the top left here, this is a, a, a horse tendon, and there's a lesion in the middle of it. And then they're looking at the ultrasound image here and trying to produce a comparison between the, the tissue type and the, uh, the, uh, the ultrasound image. And so what you see with this is you start to get different colorations and speckle patterns looking at the different categories of grade 1 is normal, grade 2 shows some early change, grade 3 shows some disintegration, 
of the fibrillar pattern in grade four is is the, is the most uh, uh, um, disrupted tendon uh, fibers. So this uh, paper, it's, I think it's very important when you're using machinery to go back to the literature on which it was based. So this one was looking uh, after uh, a, uh, a horse had undergone maximal exercise. And, sorry, I just go back. And this showed, in this particular, these, this race horse, what, what happened is they would measure the tendon before, and then they would see the changes afterwards, and it would go from the grade one to grade three, and back to grade one, two days after a race. So there was this transition between being normal, and then going down two grades, and then coming back again two, two days post-race. So what we're seeing is that change in the echo pattern here with UTC, are we seeing it, is that a physiological adaptation that occurs in tendon, or is it a pathological? So if we've got these four grades of transition, and we move and you exercise the horse, and it goes down, and then it returns back again in a certain time frame, when we're doing measures, we need to know where we are on that continuum in relationship to exercise. And this is one of the key things which will emerge out of this talk, is that a lot of the techniques have been not been looked at in relation to this exercise component. This was another study looking at Australian rules. Football players, uh, the uh, Achilles tendons responded to game loads within two days. So 18 Aus elite Australian rules players, um, and they had um, two days, uh, for two days they had uh, uh, changes within the tendon as measured on UTC, but post-match returning to baseline level after four days, suggesting a change from normal tendon integrity due to the exercise. So again, what we need to be careful of is over-interpreting if you've got a grade three change or a grade two change, but not relating that to the pre-existing exercise. So we're going to need much more measures over time to fully understand what the uh, measure actually means. If we go back to the way that this was developed, the first uh, paper that was published on this used two damaged and two structurally normal tendons. So there were just four tendons involved in the initial uh, um, evaluation. And this, they, they took a horse, and then some horses had healthy tendons, uh, uh, and some horse had had a previous injury. And after the horse, unfortunately, was uh, deceased, they then took the, the tendon and examined it under the microscope. But you would see it's a relatively few number of tendons to base a pathological diagnosis of human tendons based upon the fact that we see tendinopathy, I think, quite differently to the, what were described as acutely injured or chronically injured tendons within a horse tendon. The process of tendinosis or tendinopathy in the human, I don't think, can necessarily be applied. We see changes with in increased uh, cholesterol deposition. We see changes with increased calcification. And so how do we know that this model will then be easily applied to the human model? This paper was published uh, in 2013 and is a further evaluation now using the equine model. And the conclusion and relevance says this model displays the key features of the most human and equine degenerative tendon disorders is therefore an appropriate, if still imperfect, model of tendinopathy. So we just, what I'm saying is we need to be cautious. What UTC is definitely telling us something, but we need to be cautious about our interpretation of it. This paper from last year says, do structural changes explain the response to therapeutic exercises in, in, in tendinopathy, a systematic review? And the review says, UTC is still arguably in its infancy with regards to human populations. As a general rule, the use of imaging within tendinopathy research challenges the external validity of the finding, findings. And we need to be aware of the potential for bias with patients feeling mere, more reassured and reporting more positive outcomes when regularly investigated. The fact that we're just monitoring regularly and, and me me measuring things may give the athlete uh, some sort of positive reinforcement. So what are the pros of it? It's, it's easy, it's quick to use, 
It's valid. It will give you the same measures repeatedly, high reproducibility, high intra-observer reliability. Um, but it's only able to semi-quantify tendon structure. The samples are relatively small, and the testing rig is not suitable to all tendons. It moves in a cradle which moves in a straight line, so you wouldn't be able to do easily the supraspinatus tendon. The patella tendon, I think, is proving quite challenging because a lot of the problems with the patella tendon occur at the lower, just below the lower pole of the, uh, of the patella, and that's quite difficult for this to see. And I say it's based on this equine model. So the unanswered questions for me are definitely this machine can pick up change within tendon, but what change is it? What is it telling us in terms of um, is this pathological or is it physiological? And I think we need more work in this area. So we move on to elastography, and there are two different uh, uh, methods which I'm going to describe here. Elastography is similar to palpation. We use our finger, we press it on things, and it feels soft or it feels hard. And it's a slightly more sophisticated, sophisticated way of do, doing that. So it's applying a force or stress onto a region and measurement of the response of the stress within that tissue. So there have been described two main methods, strain or compression elastography, and the other one is shear wave. And let's have a look at both of those now. The evolution for this from the musculoskeletal perspective came from predominantly things like cancer diagnostics and, and, and examining the liver, looking at liver fibrosis. So here we have an ultrasound of a testicle. And this is using elastography, shows the coloration. And then at biopsy, we can see the, the, the tumor here. So it's been found useful in picking out certain lesions which were more difficult to identify on standard uh, ultrasound. So it uses ultrasound imaging to measure the amount of deformation induced in a tissue following manual compression. So a lot of the early systems, you actually had to apply slight pressure with the probe yourself, and that caused problems with variation. But the compression or the stress caused, by, uh, caused displacement or strain in the uh, um, tissue which was recorded and it's displayed as a, uh, uh, as a ratio between the areas uh, looked at as a surrogate ind index of stiffness. And it creates this kind of color map or uh, elastogram um, highlighting areas of harder or stiffer tissue. And the, one of the other challenging things, there are numerous manufacturers producing these systems, and some would have red as hard and some would have blue as hard, depending on the manufacturer. So it's quite confusing for users at times. This was a uh, study published in 2009 looking at sonar elastography in healthy Achilles tendons with 80 asymptomatic tendons. And it says, in healthy volunteers, the Achilles tendon appeared hard on real-time sonar elast elastography with excellent correlation to ultrasound. It didn't really tell us anything else more helpful in terms of what we could uh, do with that. It, it just con uh, confirmed what the, the, the B-mode uh, uh, um, scan showed. This study uh, looked at 50 normal Achilles tendons. And it says the quantitative assessment using the strain index has several limitations, and therefore it may only be used as a comparative index rather than as an absolute measurement. And this is one of my main gripes with this thing. Because it's measuring a ratio of measures, you're not getting an absolute value. So you can't use this longitudinally because you don't actually have quantitative data to, to measure longitudinally. So we wanted to evaluate this machine, and we've, we uh, initially undertook some studies look at using the uh, um, uh, strain elastography. And first of all, we used a, a uh, seascape uh, image to identify the midpoint of the tendon, taking the midpoint as the, the point between the, uh, the lowermost fibers of soleus and the uh, uppermost point of the calcaneum, and then looking for the midpoint. And then we would take the elastogram across the tendon along the length of it. And then this would give us the strain ratio values that you see on the side here. We did a reliability study, so we used eight participants. We measured them five times in one hour. So would we get the same value if we measured it in, the, in one hour? And we also measured it in these subjects over five days because it's really important to understand whether this gives us uh, a really valid uh, and reproducible 
um, uh, measure. And we found the coefficient of variation was greater than 53%. So this is a very poor, was giving us very poor uh, um, reliability. So for us, compression elastography, it measures ratios, not absolute values. It was quite operator dependent. There was low reproducibility. It was a qualitative estimate, not a true measure of elasticity, high coefficient of variation, and not suitable for comparing change over time. So in terms of application for the tendon, we felt that this was not a great measure. So we then moved on to a system called shear wave elastography. And this measures the, the speed of shear waves traveling through tissue. And I put this image up to try and give you a simple analogy. So when you drop a stone into a pond, it will send out ripples through the, the pond along the surface of the pond. And what happens is that the, you place a sound, the ultrasound probe places a stimulus down through the, uh, the, from the probe into the tendon, and the speed that the, the sound moves within the tendon is then proportional to the stiffness of that tissue. So how stiff it is will vary. Uh, uh, so shear waves travel faster through the stiffer tissue than through softer tissue. So you put in a known impulse, and you then measure the speed that that impulse travels through the tissue. And because we're measuring actual speed through the tissue, we can then use that to actually look at the biomechanical properties of the tendon. This was a study looking at uh, shear wave elastography um, and characterization of normal and torn Achilles tendons. And they found this very helpful in looking at uh, uh, ruptures. But I think this is kind of, we would expect to see gross changes uh, before and after a rupture. This uh, technical report looks at the repeat repeatability for measurement of tendon stiffness. And it's, um, in this particular uh, uh, study, we found that it was uh, a valid and reproducible way of, of looking at tendons over time. So my PhD student at the moment who's looking at this, we've looked at intra, intra and inter-observer reliability at the moment, which is good, repeatability is good. We've looked at whether we should use it in the transverse or the longitudinal plane. The other thing we also need to look at was the foot position. Should you place the foot in a fixed position at 90 degrees? Should you put it, allow it to be free? Should you, should you put it under an area of maximum tension? Um, and so far we've measured the difference between the free position and the foot at fixed at 90 degrees. And there was very little difference between the measures. The other thing that we wanted to look at was time of day, because if you talk to anyone with Achilles uh, uh, tendinopathy, what they will tell you is that um, I get up in the morning and my pain is, uh, I've got pain and stiffness in my tendon. It's one of the questions which is asked in the Visa A school, how long do you have stiffness for when you get up in the morning? So is that actually stiffness within the tissue, or is it a, a measure of the neuromuscular component that's activating onto the tendon, which causes that feeling of stiffness. What is that feeling of stiffness? Is it actually a change in tissue stiffness, or is it a subjective feeling that we have because of the muscle tension? And so we've done a, a study looking at uh, um, time of day. And we also want to look at the impact of temperature. Does ambient temperature affect tissue quality in terms of its stiffness and its uh, mechanical properties? And lastly, and probably most importantly for the athletic population, what is the influence of exercise on any of these measures? So if you do an acute bout of exercise, is there a change in the measures that you will see with uh, elastography? And we're currently looking at both endurance and plyometric or ballistic movements before and after uh, measures, because I think this is going to be really important when you set up a protocol to measure an athlete longitudinally that you look at pre uh, exercise as, as part of the assessment. So this is the sort of appearance that you'll get with shear wave elastography. So it's a standard, uh, the, other, the other benefit for this machine is that it's a standard ultrasound machine which just has software in it for doing the shear wave. So you've actually got a functioning ultrasound machine for diagnostic use as well. And it will give you uh, your uh, elastogram here. You can't quite see but there are little areas, the regions of interest that we put on here. And on the side, you will see the speeds for each of those areas recorded. And you can see it's about just under 10 meters per second is the uh, 
um, uh, the speed. And this is what we're seeing in normal tendons, um, approximately about uh, just under 10 meters per second. So what does shear wave elast uh, elastography possibly offer? Well, it, it gives us values that we can calculate a true elastic module, modulus. Um, it's got high intra and high inter-observer reliability. It's non-invasive and convenient. It's quantitative and can give real-time feedback. But the variability of measurements is not, not extensively assessed and controlled in published studies. So some of the studies that come out so far have not put whether they've controlled for pre-existing exercise, time of day, etc. We need much more longitudinal studies, and we also need correlations to outcomes, symptoms, and rupture. This was uh, some of the, the, uh, the data from the five-day protocol and the one-hour protocol that we saw very good agreement. So we saw a coefficient of variation of around 5%, which is very good. And in the time of day trial, we found no significant uh, change over time of day in the values that we saw using uh, the uh, uh, elastography. So we go back now to thinking about the practical implementation of these things. This is the, uh, the standard uh, uh, kind of uh, eccentric exercise protocol. I'm not sure whether the video is going to work. No, it's probably not. So this would be the standard treatment we would give people. We'd have you lowering on the injured side only, three sets of 15 repetitions, knee bent, knee straight, twice a day, 180 repetitions, adding weight uh, uh, in a backpack to progress as symptoms allow. Uh, advising the patient that it may be sore during the first few hours after <coughs> treatment. So if we want to understand whether that's the optimum protocol, if we had a validated tool such as Shearwave or UTC, we could maybe look at changing our rehabilitation programs according to the values that we're then seeing in response to the, the uh, changes in the mechanical properties of the tendon. Hoping this is going to play. So you'll probably recognize this player, most of you. But I just want you to look at the fairly innocuous movement that occurred that resulted in the Achilles rupture. Step back. Okay. Not massive forces. So one would have to really suppose that David Beckham had pre-existing changes within his tendon which presupp presupposed him to be developing that rupture with that relatively minimal force. So could we not work to try and screen players on a more regular basis to pick up those changes? I don't know whether he'd had any pre-screening with normal B-mode ultrasound, but it seems logical to me. If you have a multi-million pound squad of players and you have tools that you can look at and assess the mechanical properties of their tendons and the result of them having this injury will be catastrophic on their career, why are we not screening for this on a more regular basis? Why are we not looking at these, these players, examining their Achilles tendons, patella tendons on a, on a regular basis across the season to understand the responses. So at the present time, what we're trying to do is a collaborative study with our colleagues at uh, uh, UCH and U University College Hospital uh, in London to compare both the UTC and the shear wave on the same subjects at the same time, firstly on asymptomatic volunteers and then on to a symptomatic population. Because I think both of these tools could be very useful for us but we don't know really enough about them, about how to implement them well yet. So they're telling us something, and what we don't know is how much they're telling us. And maybe, maybe that actually combining the two techniques will tell us more, because they tell us slightly different things. But we do need these longitudinal studies and asymptomatic sports teams to identify athletes at risk, and I think that would be exceedingly helpful going forward, and maybe something we can discuss uh, in, in a minute. And the other thing I want to just briefly talk about is something just we just started a very brief pilot on, is looking at a, a te technique called magnetization transfer contrast, um, which is a quantitative imaging uh, using M MRI, and it provides an insight interactions between free and bound water, 
and this is one of the first uh, scans we've done on it and we're just starting to think about what can this tell us about the changes more maybe about the um, uh, about the matrix between the tendons rather than the, the collagen itself in response to inflammatory change or responses to exercise. Um, it's an area that's been used in the brain uh, an awful lot but very little in the tendon. I think there's a couple of papers published on on the use of this in, in the tendon. So these are our first couple of images that we've had but I think it's just shows that we don't really fully understand the pathology or the optimum management of Achilles disease tendinopathy at the present time. But if we can work collaboratively to try and utilize these tools, but very openly be quite critical of some of the limitations of them too, and understand that it is really crucial to, to set your protocols up, that you understand the pr prior exercise, time of day, uh, all these things are taken into account when you do measures, because if you interpret it to the athlete without that, then I think you may be giving them false information. So I think it's an area that is really going to either show that it has no real impact on our clinical uh, 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 life or we may find a place for it. At the moment, the jury is out. And I just want to raise that caution. I think they're interesting tools, but where do they really sit in clinical practice? I think there is still a lot of work to be done. But I think um, it's very, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to share with you my thoughts on this, and I'd be really grateful for any questions or thoughts about it. Thank you.